it, interestingly enough, it's been kind of the opposite of a challenge, um, which has been this, this remarkable creative experience because there's something about a supernatural universe that you would think actually would make it easier to create tension and build conflict and have big, big scares, big ideas, big sequences. And that is true in a lot of ways. It's sort of, you know, pick the best idea out of a hat. But, but it's also incredibly difficult to continue to, you know, vividly make your mark act to act or episode to episode. Um, and you can end up accidentally overtopping yourself. Um, and, and in a non-supernatural universe, there's just its character and its humanity and its human beings and how they relate to each other. And then, you know, of course, the added bonus of this really is genre, this piece, because there's the, the virus itself is a monster. Um, it's the, the jaws and the monster under the bed and all those things, you know. So it's, you know, I, I assume writing a nice family drama would, would be more difficult probably. But this is a perfect blend of just being able to, like, really explore humanity and also give people a little, you know, nudge attention or suspense or mystery and that kind of thing. Did you know when you started what caused the virus or is that something that you guys are going to... And how long will it take for us to figure out what's going on in that whole situation? Uh, it's, you know, it's honestly, it's a very long, slow uh, journey through the first season. It's something that the Belgian series did really nicely, and I, I really took my hat off to them with how they unfolded the details of their mystery of, you know, who brought it here, how to get here, what is it, and that kind of thing. And we try to, you know, we try not to stall ever, but we try to dole it out in very small doses. It's not... Um, it's not a lost-sized mystery that will have you, you know, screaming, like, what happened and how, when did we find out, you know, every episode. But it is enough just to kind of wet your whistle and keep you keep you engaged in asking those questions, um, which I like, you know, I like a kind of a subtle thread of a conspiracy as opposed to, you know, get it going all boring on it from the get-go. Well, building on that, is there going to be an evolution of the virus? Will we see it change or anything throughout the series? We do see small shifts in it. You know, uh, one of the choices that we made going into this was to try to keep everything as grounded as possible in real-world predicaments and, and not not um, falling prey to the urge of making something bigger or weirder or cooler uh, and try to hold off on that as long as we could and maximize what we could get out of the very simple idea of a virus to which there is no cure. Um, that being said, there is a, you know, there's some elements that shift about the virus which throw people for a couple loops and it certainly leaves a door wide open for the future of the series in which anything can go. Can you talk about the, the moral um, questions that will kind of come up throughout the series? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a series grounded a lot in, in humanity and humanity has both its, its beautiful and its ugly sides and so you see people constantly faced with decisions that they have to make uh, in, in a complete crisis-based situation. There's also the fact that the first thing that happens is, um, is the patient zero is a man of Middle Eastern descent. And so, of course, there's a lot of fingers pointing and a lot of anger and a lot of hostility and some xenophobia. And, and it has to make a lot of people ask over the course of the series, like, you know, why are we so quick to to point our fingers in a certain direction. Um, there's some nice uh, subtextual racial politics. Um, and it, But really, it's, it, you know, it's, it's uh, who are you and what kind of person are you in this kind of situation? Does it really bring out the side of you that you're proud of or does it bring out a side of you that you hope you never have to see again? When you were developing this show, did you have Chris Wood in mind for Jay? No, I didn't. Um, I thought, <laughs> I thought Chris was too young and I, I knew that I was very responsive to him as an actor and very excited about him as an actor, and uh, I knew that he would be coming available. And I hated the idea of, <laughs> I hated the idea of him going to work for somebody else, you know? Like, I felt like he was this, this incredible find, you know, this diamond that we had dug up in, you know, in, the, in the desert and couldn't imagine him going to do somebody else's show. And so I was like, all right, look, I'm going to bring him in. Not going to say anything. Just going to see what other people think. And um, and Nutter was with me at the casting session, 
And by this point, by the way, Chris had been at my house like over the holidays playing cards because we're big game geeks. And so he had seen the whole Belgian version. He, you know, had called me when he read the script being like, this part is mine. And I'm like, uh-huh, you know, like, <laughs> good luck, buddy, you know. And, um, and he was so invested in it. And I was like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, please, please, please don't, like, please do well. And I didn't say a word, and he walked out of the room, and David Nutter was like, that kid is fantastic. He's it for me. I want him. You know? And I was like, okay, so she, are you sure? You know? <laughs> you don't think he's too young? And he's like, no, no, like, tell him to grow some facial hair. He'll look great. You know? And lo and behold, here we are. 